Hi. This is this. That's me. Um, now, this is a bit of a sneaky title. It's only, only slightly, though. Um, it's advertised as have a build and automate it with thing. But it might as well just be called have a build and automate. Um, we will definitely be looking at thing, but it's not, uh, and, and, and some details, particularly as it applies to Drupal, but it's not a, a, a deep dive into thing. It's, uh, that would be in even more boring than a, a presentation on automated build processes. So if that's what you're after, then I'm sorry. There is a really good manual online, though. Not sure they're there for. So um, I build a lot of Drupal sites. I'm a Drupal developer in Sydney. I work for Previous Next. And um, I've been doing Drupal since about 2006 in, in some way, shape, or form. And I've kind of gone through the, the you know, fairly common, common evolution of, of you know, working by myself, working on larger projects that need teams and, and that sort of stuff. So over the years, I've become more interested in uh, things like how, how we scale Drupal teams and, and, and some of the problems that, that kind of come up. You know, Drupal's obviously not, not designed or doesn't work the same way as software frameworks. And, and so there's some sort of um, problem, problems you run into fairly early as soon as you need to work with someone. Um, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, um, but uh, but we, we you know we do a bit of everything as well. So um, you know a lot of site building, a lot of module development, front end stuff. Uh, we do with accessibility and cross browser stuff, performance. You know it's the the beauty of working on Drupal projects is often you get to get to dip your toes in everywhere and. Um, and integration, integration problems, of course, that sort of stuff. So um, this is in the DevOps track. Um, so I'm interested in, in this sort of stuff from a, a developer's perspective. Um, so uh, interested in you know, DevOps as applying agile practices throughout, throughout the, uh, the organization, so from, from dev to to delivery, so really focusing on on shipping, and we'll, we'll get into some of that. Um, so this is fairly applicable to uh, a, a, a wide wide group. I don't know what sort of people would come to a talk like this, um, but you know, ho hopefully you're, you have some involvement in in actually delivering sites. That's sort of what we're talking about. Um, so that that could that could be developing. It could be could be. Um, Helping, helping developers uh, ship um, or, or testing or, or whatnot. So um, this is a, a, a topic that kind of applies across the board. So we'll kind of go through it this way. We'll sort of uh, have a look at um, uh, some of the problems that emerge um, as you kind of scale team, teams up. So th I mean, this is, this is definitely, I'm trying to sell you on build processes in general um, and then we'll get into some specifics. So, um, so we're kind of starting at the beginning. So keep that in mind. Feel free to walk out if you've already got your build automated and your CI working and, and that sort of stuff. This is this is um, you can stay for the thing if you want to see that, I guess. But it may, may not be uh, that useful for you. But if you're curious about build processes and you, you haven't really done that or you, you, you you're um, looking to improve, then then hang around. Um, so we'll, we'll cover s some, of, some of that motivation and then um, look at some of the how, some Drupal examples, um, which involve Thing, and, um, and then I'll give you some advice that we've kind of gleaned from, from sort of making a mess of some of our, our build scripts and, um, and fixing them and, and, uh, and also some, uh, some patterns we, we picked up from the, the community. So. Quick story. Um, there is no one workflow, and this is sort of what we're dealing with uh, with the build process. Is we're going to try and try and tighten up our workflow to automate it. You know, this is this is this is what the DevOps is about. So um, there's definitely no particular like golden workflow for Drupal. I mean, Drupal is used in 
all sorts of ways, scaled all the way up and all the way down, um, single person shops to, to you know, big, big teams and big, big hard problems. So even though there's no one workflow uh, and the processes and tools are gonna change depending on your situation, um, having a process and having a workflow is still very important. Um, although I, I, I will give a caveat that, that a lot of this stuff is gonna be less useful if you're, you're working by yourself, but if you have goals to expand, uh, then uh, pay attention. So um, who here is uh, familiar with the, the Agile Manifesto? Yeah. You know, the, the very first bit, and it says, we are, we are uh, uncovering better ways, I've written down, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others to do it. Through this work, we've come to value, blah, blah. And the first one is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So this is all about tools and processes, but it's important to, to as, you, as you're nerding out on this stuff, keep your eyes on the prize. Uh, we're uh, all about delivering value. Um, and if anyone saw the, the BHAT talk, I think it was in this room, um, that, that had a very, very good summary of um, uh, the, you know, the motivation. So keeping your, keeping your eyes on the prize that we're, we're delivering value and not get lost in the, the weeds of all this automation stuff. Um, let, it, let it serve our purposes. So um, so I used to work by myself, I don't know if anyone else did. Um, life was easier then. Um, didn't ne really need things like configuration management. Um, maybe used version control. I was probably more interested in using version control to deploy, which is not a great idea either. Um, but that's all fine. And then you start to work on things where you, uh, projects where you need to work with other people. So, and this is where the problems start. Um, you do aut automation before, so. The, the, this, this evolution is not, not in one particular order, but th these are the sort of things that I, I kind of noticed as I worked on bigger projects. So uh, as, as you work on teams, you start to use uh, things like version control to communicate with people, not just to deploy. Um, you, of course, you use exportables, um, and that's, that's a, uh, a source of uh, automation uh, opportunity. Um, syncing environments, this sort of stuff becomes a reality. Um, different tools. So uh, as you work on different pro uh, different projects, you start to, bigger projects, you start to need things like solar and um, uh, of course server stuff, mem memcached and, and, and all sorts of things that, that uh, smaller projects are, are less of a problem. And not only do you need them in production, you need them in different environments and you need to track them. And so this is the, this is the, the guts. This is where it start, starts to really uh, become a problem because doing this stuff just by yourself, it's not that bad. You have a production server, uh, you put solar on that, you need solar on your laptop. What's the problem? Uh, the problem is when you have different versions on different laptops and different operating systems and that sort of stuff. So is this familiar kind of territory? Yeah, okay. Um, and then um, uh, development ramp up, of course, is probably the, 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 other, the other thing which I, I hear a bit of pain about every now and then. and. Uh, and that just gets compounded as we, we get more and more complex stack, uh, technology stacks. So this is, this is um, related to it. So of course we start scripting the stuff away at various times. Um, we set up new sites, we have a script to deploy, we have scripts, sync environments, we have scripts, manage our exportables. Maybe we type it in, maybe we have a script. Um, it's a bit ad hoc perhaps at the beginning, but you know, obviously we, we recognize that these are uh, boring parts that are g getting in our way, so we often do our best to try to automate them. Then we think, well, maybe we can, uh, I've heard of this CI thing, maybe we can do some of this stuff on the server, so we copy, copy scripts to the server and we run them there. Um, um, so now we, now we can uh, maybe even automate it on checking, things like that. Um, and maybe some of you have even gotten this far, which is you start checking scripts into your source code repository so that you can kind of share them. That's kind of the next stage. Um, and th this is all, all sort of heading in one direction. I think you, you kind of play with this stuff for a while until you start to think, oh, maybe, 
maybe I need a build system. So, oops, that's a build system. It has tools now. Um, so some of the build systems around are things like make, rake, is there a jake, lots of aches, maven and ant, and, and, um, and they build stuff. Build, 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 build. Uh, yes, build. So what am I talking about? Um, it's kind of kind of a hard thing to, to summarize like what like what a build is. It's not a script. Um, uh, it's not it's not compiling. What is it? It's kind of a job. Some people use it to just mean a task. Any ideas? It's it's the waste. It's the it's the non development tasks that we do. Um, so anything that we have to do to get the code running that's not writing the code. So it's, it's uh, you know, we have a, have a word for this in sort of agile and stuff and it, it's waste. And it's not, it's, you know, it's a necessary evil, so it's not a, not a terrible word, um, but it's something that we need to be aware of. We need to always know how much waste we've got so that we can look at it regularly as part, you know, part of our, our retrospectives and, uh, and speed it up, automate it, make it smaller if we can, sometimes we can't because it includes things like deploying, which, I mean, we have to do that. Um, and, uh, but it does need to be automated. So, let's have a look. Boring, repetitive, automatable, yes, it's a build. That's what it is. So, just in case you, you're confused, it's, 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 uh, sometimes hear it in context of compiling code and um, uh, the reason is because for compiled systems um, it's not so much about uh, com compiling is not the problem that they're solving with the build tool it's compi compiling lots of things and then compiling things that take a long time and then managing uh, managing all that together so uh, dependencies between different different things that need to get compiled and orders and then um, really really uh, taking uh, taking care of the time problem there so uh, we have these problems we're starting to have these problems even on non-compiled projects so we do repetitive tasks and some of them are dependent dependent on others and um, and uh, we want to shorten the time between making the solution and deploying it so that's what builds are about so a, a build, a good build should have a few properties. Um, it should be shippable. Again, we're focusing on delivering value. So things like auto deployment and continuous delivery, this is on the road to that. Continuous integration, this is, this is really the, the glue that, that, that gets us there. So if we have a good automated build process that we're, we're maintaining and keeping healthy, then the rest of this stuff kind of falls out um, and we're managing our waste and we're not, we're not creating it. So, um, while we, we do automate lots of development stuff, um, focusing on the, the pipeline to production is uh, a sign of a good build process. Um, should be repeatable is a, an important one. So, uh, it should be a tool to control our complexity, not add to it. So, uh, it's a fine line with this stuff. You can, it can run out of control, but, um, it should be repeatable. You should be able to take the same source code out of version control into different environments, run the build, and get the same output. It's a, a simple goal, but it often often goes uh, haywire. It's you know one of those things. Um, you had environment parity problems, so you introduced an automated build process, and now you've got two problems. So I mean, just a, a quick word on the, the environment differences. There, I mean, they're inevitable, right? I mean. Staging is never going to be exactly like production. Development's definitely not. And laptops definitely not. But we make them as close as we can. We use a, uh, the build process to try to identify the differences and um, and and manage that complexity. So it's it's easier to reason about. So when we do have uh, environment differences, we we know where they are. And this is the sort of thing you get out of a, a, an automated build process. 
festival. So just by by extension of, of focusing on shipping to production, um, it's going to be inspectable, executable. We can run it. We can we can performance test it. Uh, we can we can look at look at the final code and um, lint it and do all the things that all the things we may may need to do. And of course, run run all our tests, which for us, I don't know about you, but that's a huge suite of of um, functional testing mainly. So is a is a slow test. And we want to run these um, before they hit production. So it's no use if um, we can only test it live. And la last but not least, it, it produces artifacts, things you can inspect and things you can deploy. So artifacts is everything from test reports to uh, the actual e uh, executable product. So that takes us to what our builds made of get into the pieces so other builds that's right they're made of other builds they are sometimes made of other builds so I'm going to use some thing language here um, uh, you'll hear, hear words like you know scripts actions stuff like that in, in, in builds literature but um, just to keep it simple I'll, I'll break things down into the thing components so we've got our tasks. Uh, we want to run a script. We want to execute a shell command. We want to copy some files. You know, it's just boring stuff that we need to do. Uh, say we're installing Drupal. We need to change file permissions, or um, it can even be things set. Up, it can even be deploy type things. Set up a database in a <laughs> development environment, but um, it varies. A lot. Of this stuff is obviously going to change depending on your setup, but that's that's the beauty of it. Um, so then we group those into to targets. Um, these are the things that we actually run uh, generally. So, um, and they'll they'll actually take us to our, our desired state. So they'll there'll be a few different tasks: uh, run the script, copy the files, um, uh, check the lint, lint the code, so that sort of stuff. Um, and we've got our environment. Um, so this is going to change. Different different sets of external files, uh, different servers, and um, different properties, and we'll we'll get briefly into that too. And tying it all together, uh, what we call jobs. So this is this is outside the build process generally, but this is just running a target uh, in a given environment. So uh, we do this with Jenkins. And we tend to do it using Fing. So, uh, anyone here using Jenkins at the moment? <laughs> Everyone, yay. Anyone using Fing at the moment? Yay. You're in the wrong room. Maybe. Okay. So, Fing is not GNU make. So, who's using Fing uh, lo locally, like in local development, like a lot? Only a couple, and using it on the on the build server only. About the same, about half half. Interesting. Both. Who's using both? Not me. All right. So Fing, uh, for those who don't know, is a. It's called Fing is not going to make. Uh, it's a build tool. It's basically a, a clone of Apache Ant, uh, which is a Java. Uh, build tool, Java in the sense that it's written in Java, it's extended in Java. Um, so Fing is to Ant as, say, the hat is to Cucumber. Um, very similar, almost exactly the same. Um, and the build scripts are XML. XML, sort of little XML DSL thingies. So um, we'll, s we'll see a few of them. Uh, it's it's Probably the worst part of Fing um, is that you're dealing with XML and <coughs> it's uh, fairly difficult to try to make a XML heavy presentation exciting in any way. But there's a plus. We can expand it with PHP. So this is this is a, this is a big win and this is really why we went with it. Um, you know. Um, Something like Rake 
uh, and there's a lot of great there's a lot of great build tools out there. But the way we use it, we run a lot locally. We want to get the same same build uh, targets local and on the server. So we want our developers to be actually using it, to be automating their tasks, and they know PHP. So it's a, a simple matter of um, friction there. This is uh, this is stuff that works best from the ground up. So your developers should be able to um, sort of stuff they would be doing in shell scripts, perhaps if they, if they know a bit of that. They should be able to do it in this, and then put it in version control and share with everyone. So that's that's sort of the goal. That's kind of the, the, the takeaway of why why thing and not not something else. But anything everyone's comfortable with is really what you should be using. Um, because these these build jobs should go in, go into source control and and everyone can uh, can collaborate on them. So so no Java runs everywhere. Obviously going to run on your server stack. Um, so that's all good. So I'll give some uh, summary of uh, just broad overview of the, the the big pieces of thing. It's pretty straightforward. It matches up with the, the pieces of a build. So we have projects. Sorry if that's a bit small. Better. So it's XML. Very exciting. Has hierarchy. So that's you know the main feature. So you've got a lot of nesting going on. So the project is the root node. That's really all, all, all you need to know. Um, you give it a name and you stick the file in the root of your project and now you're good to go. And you can put all your jobs in there. Um, and like we said before, you have tasks grouped into targets, so the targets go inside the project, the tasks are executed in the target. Easy. Each target can depend on other targets. So here we've got a build, build target that needs some sort of initialization target. This is pretty standard stuff. And you can specify a default for the whole project. So um, generally, you'll, you'll you'll find that what you're aiming for is like one one good kind of ready to go. Download the source code. Maybe install some dependencies with Composer, like maybe install Thing with Composer, and then run the Thing uh, default build, and that should that should run everywhere. So you want you probably want to keep the CI specific stuff in in, in a different build, um, and you have some development tasks in other builds. But you know this should be anything that you absolutely positively need to get going. You put it in a default build, and you just just call it like that, and you're done. So tasks are a little bit more interesting. This is where we start to kind of make our little DSL um, for our <coughs> for our build processes. Um, so here's one for that someone made for Drush. Um, so rather than just having a you know back going back to shell script again, um, it's a, it's a bit easier to manage. Um, we can kind of see see where we're parameter parameterizing and um, and kind of injecting different uh, different environment setups. Um, so if you're not doing this, I mean I know it's it's natural to get started with this and jump straight to just execing out and running shell stuff, but this is really where you want to be because that stuff gets unwieldy very quickly. Um, and the way you do all that injection stuff is with properties. So uh, we use properties to pass uh, the, the context. Um, so we'll have different context when, when we're running on Jenkins, different when we're running on our laptop, often the same, same build tasks. Um, so here, here's a very exciting hello world type one. I haven't tried these, by the way, so if you're typing them in, I can't promise they'll work. They're about right, though. Um, so properties can come in from various various places. It's a, it's very robust system. Um, you can pull them in from uh, command line options directly, which is great for for CI and all in all sorts of contexts. Um, uh, properties files, of course, is the the main one. Um, so we we uh, ship with um, sort of a a, a build properties file often uh, to get pe get people going. It's kind of you know most people are on similar setups, but if they're a special snowflake on their their laptop, they can um, they can just tweak that and run the same build jobs. Um, 
and you can also get properties in interactively through the command prompt, so you can use it as a, an interactive tool as well. So that's that's Fing. It's pretty straightforward. Um, any any questions on that so far? No, nope. easy. Installing is very straightforward. Um, we use the composer method now, which um, I think this, I think that the website still still uh, lists the pair one, but uh, the composer one is definitely um, uh, solid. Um, so you can you can even go down to um, having uh, locking in the version for the project, which I mean I, I'm a I'm a vendoring fan, so I don't mind that at all. Um, and using it's um, you know straightforward. So tasks tasks can log stuff to the console. If you haven't seen a build tool before, it's kind of like a, a regimented shell script. Um, and you can choose when when to when to log stuff to the console or not, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's obviously fail and fail and success status, and it bubbles up. So task can fail, makes the target fail, makes the build fail, gets picked up by the CI server, and they all talk the same language. And there's a you know um, an easy way to get through that. So. Uh, the output and any part artifacts uh, are there at the end, and they can be uh, used by typically CI server, um, also for reporting. So they kind of you two ways to get results there. Um, so is is everyone doing this sort of stuff? Um, uh, how how we um, how how we integrating thing in in CI land these days? Uh, are you are you just looking at the console output or Anything else? Yes, no? Console output, inspect it, or just pass fail? Pass fail? Pass fail. All right, so what are you doing with it then? If you <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. So we, we use both. Um, um, uh, we do, uh, once we have a failing build, we'll, we'll have some artifacts to inspect generally. Um, so that brings us to kind of what what we put in, so uh, the Drupal-y stuff. So th these are the sort of things that we automate. And again, we take a bit of a different approach. So um, I think it's good to good to go bot bottom up with this sort of stuff. So uh, something that a developer would do by hand, they might want to automate it. They put it in the build. Eventually, it'll kind of sneak in upstream rather than putting all your logic into your Jenkins server. Um, that should be fairly dumb. So. But we do we do a lot of the standard Drupal stuff. We want to automate everything that isn't real development work. So this is I, know I said it before, but this is absolutely everything. Um, so if you if you find yourself doing something by hand, then then stick it stick it in here. Um, so we we sync databases, we run tests. Um, uh, we did some managing of our exportables and front-end tasks and and, um, and then that, that default build, of course, to kind of get people bootstrapped. So um, I'll show you some examples. Uh, I tried to, tried to tease out some of our specifics and kind of give you a, an, an idea of the sort of thing that, that uh, might be generally useful, but a lot of this stuff is environment-specific. So... Um, so we, we sync environments with Drush. Anyone else? Environments with Drush. Good. Environments by hand, dumping the database. Yeah? Okay. So you start doing it with Drush, and then you get sick of typing Drush SQL sync over and over and over and over again. So you make a shell script, and then you get sick of that, and you start to manage it this way. So this is pretty cool. So we can um, we can run the same sync on the CI, on the CI, because we've parameterized the the, uh, the source and destinations. Um, and we, we're dropping it first, which is often important. So we're ca capturing those little little details. Let's see. So that's what a real task looks like. Um, it has its own own name and its own set of um, uh, properties, etc. So they're they're all they're all defined in PHP. Um, 
and I don't have a slide on that, but if you're interested, I can I can pull up the I think the Dross one is a simple enough example. They're they're, they're quite brain dead the um, the uh, task definition, so quite simple. We run our tests, so might might look something like this. Again, we're not not calling out to the shell directly. We're we're kind of capturing what's important. So where are our bahat tests stored? Um, where's the executable? That's like the main one. This this is the sort of thing that lets us run it in different environments because that's just another property. Um, where do we put our output? So same build job, different environments. Uh, and parameterized, and even even stuff that's um, really drupally, like um, dealing with features, for instance. So, I think I worked out that the at one point the the only surefire way to revert features clearly or cleanly was to clear the cache twice, list the features, revert the features, clear the cache again, and then do like a little dance. But this, this works, I think. So you can see um, here, uh, we're calling out to other thing targets. So build it up into little pieces and, um, and, and keep it clean. This is actually not how our low our current scripts look, but they will soon. Some refactoring required. Okay, that's, this is another interesting one, actually, that one of our developers came up with. Um, he got sick, uh, we use sort of a feature, a feature branch-based workflow. So he got sick of going to another branch, checking the branch out, um, syncing the database for uh, like a peer review kind of setup. So what's this branch gonna do on uh, the current, current uh, uh, test instance that everyone's working against? Um, so, you know, there's obviously some repetitive stuff around that. So he wrapped it up in a, a switch branch uh, task and then made a branch branch target. So now whenever he wants to test the branch or any, now he's checked it into the projects, now everyone's got the, got the task and just tells everyone about it. All they have to do is type in thing branch, uh, branch name, uh, or actually in this version it's, uh, it's interactive. So it says, what do you want to call the branch? Feature X, um, if, if the branch exists, like you're checking someone else's work, then it will, it will switch to that branch, sync the database, revert the features all in one go. So type one thing and, and, um, and now you're looking at exactly what, what they were looking at. So it makes reviews a lot smoother. This is, this is the sort of little, little stuff that um, uh, productivity improvements um, that are important. Boring, boring, boring jobs solved. Front-end tasks even. So th this is becoming more common. Um, so anyone here using SAS a lot? Yeah, so um, uh, you, ne you need some way to manage this stuff. So probably the, the interesting one here is that we're using Bundler to lock down the versions of the SAS stuff. So this is, um, this is the, the complex, annoying world we live in. Um, uh, for instance, if you wanted source maps perfectly, uh, you know, perfectly uh, re required feature for de de dealing with some of these uh, uh, post-processed uh, style sheets. Um, you needed, you know, bleeding edge version, check out of, of this compass thing and that, or it, it wouldn't work. One developer might battle with that and solve it. They check it into the source repository uh, in, the, in, in the lock file, and then everyone else just keeps using the same task. Um, it'll It'll uh, depend on a, a um, uh, generally we have a, a, pr a prep, uh, a prep task, and that'll that'll make sure that uh, bundler install or update. I don't remember which. It's the opposite to to um, composer. I don't have to remember because we just use thing, and uh, they magically get the, uh, the the right version, and everyone's on the same page. So seemingly simple stuff that can go annoyingly wrong, but you only have to solve it once. Um, and then we, we generally, again, put, put this stuff all together in a, a, a big default build. Okay. I think 
we're doing pretty good there. So really, I'm, I'm just going to go quickly over some, um, some patterns. You've probably noticed some of them before. They're, they're, a lot of them are common sense, but they're kind of the, the important kind of takeaways if you, you want to have a healthy uh, build, uh, build trip. So we've got, uh, this, this is a favorite of mine. So it, it's called uh, a working skeleton in this book, but it's, it's an approach that I've often taken with this sort of stuff. Um, um, if you, you know, deal with things like drush make and things that can kind of get a bit complicated, you don't do the whole, or you don't retrofit, you know, to a large project, or you don't do the whole thing in one go. Um, and we focus on deploying to production. So it, it can be very difficult to retrofit a lot of this stuff and get it working smoothly. So the way, the way to do it is obviously start at the beginning if you can. And don't just start at the beginning. Take that thin slice approach. So get it working local on the CI server, auto deploying nothing, auto deploy an empty site and do that first. And then you'll you'll kind of you'll know when it's broken and, and it'll be easy to maintain. So that's that's a simple tip, but I, I kind of see it done wrong. Um, and that's kind of you know the agile way. Uh, location agnostic is a pretty straightforward one. Uh, make sure it has access to all the files you need. Use relative paths, that sort of stuff, um, uh, and version the script with the source. So don't put the build XML on the Jenkins server. Put it in the, the project group. So uh, that's sort of the way to go. Um, and that's that's you know it's like dependency injection, script injection. So keep the CI scripts on the CI server. Um, so you will have CI configuration or your job configuration and, and maybe some other stuff that's specific to those environments but don't we don't manage them in the source control repository but you might manage them however you're managing your server configs uh, puppet for instance um, but keep the app build scripts with the app uh, one for each project you have a starter one but you know let it diverge project to project if you if you work on lots of different projects that's fine um, and you know it's got to be something that you're free to improve and add to and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and then we just get into sort of some optimization stuff. So you'll, once you get into this, you'll notice that the build times get bigger and bigger and slower and slower and they pile up. So, um, you know, look into breaking up targets. This is sort of stuff that we're just, just getting pain points on now and looking at ways of fixing. So uh, it's probably more a continuous integration topic, but you can start at the build and, and kind of get your targets to, um, you know, not obviously not be rerunning the same target when you have dependencies, and um, get a bit get a bit more of a flow going. If there's a, a slow target, like find a way to reuse that. You can put some logic in and you can kind of check for results. And, and there's li little hacks and tricks you can do to to not run the same build over and over again. If it's been successful, move it forward. That's this classic CI pipeline kind of thing that you're kind of going for. And it's really about just uh, the, the, build, the build jobs should actually get faster and faster the further down the pipeline you get. Um, and you do that by getting jobs that trigger other jobs. Um, and uh, so that's called cumulative builds. Um, and th those, were, those were actually taken out of a, a great book on build processes. Um, so it's not a CI talk, um, but the beauty of this sort of stuff is that if you follow this approach, of starting at the bottom, um, I actually recommend people don't don't start with a uh, continuous integration server like right at the beginning or or you know take that working skeleton approach and, and have it have it very simple. Don't try to pile heaps of logic in there. And um, this is a, a Travis file, and that's that's a CI configuration. I mean, all the all the real work is done in the. The um oh sorry it's cut off. It's done right at the bottom. Thing build. Um, so that's about I think we've got maybe three minutes, two minutes for questions. Sorry if I, I ran a little long. Um, there's some must read books if you haven't seen read continuous delivery. It's like the best book ever, and uh, and that's the book that I got the. Uh, the patterns out of. So, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Uh, 
It is. Uh, so the, uh, this is a statement, a comment that Ant is language agnostic for extensions. Right, 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 right. I, I don't have a preference. Um, again, it was um, the fact that I can, I can, I can write a, a custom task, you know, with n totally from scratch with very basic PHP knowledge. I mean, the, the it's dead simple. I don't need a Java compiler or anything. So I, if you're saying that I don't need that for Ant, then I would guess that they're exactly the same, and I'm I'm confused. <laughs> but um, but the, as far as I know, the 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 config syntax is. I mean, I've seen I've seen Ant build configs, and they look very similar. I mean, it's it's XML. So, so. Yeah. Yep. Uh, do you have somewhere blog or something like this where you are published uh, something like a? a Template for the build XML. Yeah, or um, like I, I'll probably blog, blog this yeah? stuff. Yeah. But um, if you don't want to wait, um, go to. I think there's something from a long time ago. Uh, Drupal project template, maybe. <laughs> but I'll, I'll put that in the blog as well. Thank you. Thank um, you. But yeah, look on if you're curious. Yeah, I think that works. So. Yeah, thank you. Right. Is there a, so? Question is: Is there an extension to use non-XML build language? Uh, no, uh, not as not as far as I know. That's really the that's kind of the, the problem with Bing. But all of this stuff is applicable to any any build tool. So pick one you like um, and 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 run with it. But again, I would I would lean towards things that your developers can actually use to extend and not make it a and operations only, or only one guy in the oper in the organization knows Ruby or whatever. But other than that, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So go <laughs> go with what what's frictionless. I think is the way. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, there are many. Um, I guess I kind of brushed over that. Um, so standardized execu execution. So you've got one one command to run. That's a big one. I mean, you could write your own meta shell script, but that's you know that's painful. Um, uh, what else? Uh, the reporting. So a lot often these build tools uh, kind of use a, a reporting format uh, or support a reporting format. Um, uh, or not so much build tools. They plug into the CI servers like straight away, so you don't have to do any extra work. Um, so that's a, that's a big plus. There's, pl there's plugins for Bing, Maven, Ant, Rake, etc. For for all the all the CI servers, so it just glues together and and easy. Um, but I, I'd say the 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 maintenance of shell scripts gets out of hand for for me. I mean, writing XML scripts is ugly, so you should try to make them less scripty and more declarative and smaller and and there's kind of a subtle advantage of using such a horrible language like XML, uh, in that it, it makes you makes you keep them tighter. Um, you don't. Whereas with shell, I find I'll my shell scripts can get out of hand quite quickly because uh, it's uh, it's you know easier to get stuff done in it. So there's lots of reasons, but I'd say they're the main ones. Oh, oh, I'm s uh, that's th I really should have mentioned that. Okay. That yeah, <laughs> that was a that was a big thank you very much. That was a big uh, oversight on my part. There are hundreds of like pre-done tasks for copying files, changing permissions, deploying stuff, dealing with even there's even like a like a Drupal update system, like database um, migration system. Um, what else does it do? E everything. I mean, you don't you don't have to write too many of these things, um, um, but they're easy to write as well. So that's. That's also the, the, the big win for Fing, and I'm assuming that Ant has a similar library, but Fing has an absolutely wonderful library of hundreds of, of ready-to-go tasks that are, that are just, yeah, work. Yeah. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you.
Oh, and two quick things. Uh, the survey thing and the code sprint. Code sprint, don't forget the code sprint. <laughs>